the Fury really started life as a, as a land plane design. It was um, the next progression from the Typhoon Tempest generation. And the Air Force didn't want the Fury as a, as a, as a land-based fighter. They were looking ahead to the jets, and quite rightly so too. The, the fleet air arm was still interested in uh, having a, a propeller-driven aircraft. And so its design got adapted from what we'd learned from things like um, the Corsair. So you've got a widely spaced undercarriage with, a, uh, with really good technology for putting an aircraft hard onto a deck. Um, and trying to cram as much power out of a piston engine into a smaller fighter as you could manage, plus fuel. Naval fighters need long legs, and so this thing had uh, plenty of range. This must have been the ultimate piston engine challenge to put on an aircraft carrier. We had all sorts of problems with some aircraft like the Seafire, and I've talked to guys who, who, who flew this onto the deck, um, and it was challenging, it was difficult. You can see the landing attitude here, the nose stuffed up right up in the air, and although the visibility out of the cockpit is beautiful when it's flying, um, with the tail down, um, you can just see yards of heavy metal, frankly. Um, so it was a curved approach, um, and although the undercarriage was very forgiving, the speed regime was very close to the stall, and if they got low, they pushed power on, they ended up with a thing called torque stall, where the aircraft just rolled over and hit the island or went into the sea. So they had their work cut out putting this thing on the deck, they certainly did. As an aeroplane to fly, it's a complete joy. You're sitting in the middle of it, you feel as though you put the thing on like a glove, and although I've got very, very few hours on it at the moment. I feel very comfortable in the cockpit. I don't mean by that that I feel uh, that I know everything about the aeroplane. Far from it. I'm on a very steep learning curve. But it is a complete joy to fly. And that difficult visibility when you're approaching the deck transforms itself into something that actually makes the aircraft very easy to fly once you're up and running. Because you've got a very good attitude uh, definition with the cowling out in front of you. It's tremendously responsive in all planes and it's got oodles of power. Eagles of the Fleet was made in 1950, just before hostilities started in Korea. When the forces of the Royal Navy take the ocean, they are accompanied by naval aircraft to command the sky above, to observe, to defend, to attack. let's enter the gates of a typical naval air station where the flying sailors learn their trade. Tomorrow they'll thrust the planes forward, fighting fit into the first line. Behind closed doors, pilots and observers keep track of secret electronic weapons. And there's dirty work at hand. And smiling faces too. I remember uh, the end of the war very, very vividly because it's then we chose to go in the Navy. And the, the period of call-up was when you were 16, you had to go and register, and I registered for the Navy. And indeed, I, I preempted that because I went and volunteered when I was 17 and a half. I went up to Charing Cross and I volunteered to go into the Navy. And uh, I wanted particularly to go into the Fleet Air Arm and not the Navy itself because I wanted to mess about with carriers and aeroplanes. <laughs> Work over, there's time to play. A pint of beer. A snack before turning in. Freshen up in the barber's chair. If he's permission to grow, well then, a trim or two around the chin. It's coming in! On parade, there's a reward each month for the smartest turnout. And for the most ship-shaped mess deck, the commanding officer offers his congratulations hands the winner a shield of honour and, triumph of the galley, 24 pounds of sugar, plums and marzipan. Well, we did um, about 100 dummy deck landings ashore um, where you got used to all the batsman's signals and, uh, and also to coming all the way around the, the corner in a turn uh, and picking a wing up at the end and so on. All those short-based ones were very useful. You then went to the training carrier, um, where you did uh, normal free takeoffs, as they were called. You went off the catapult for the first time. You did rocket-assisted takeoffs for the first time. 
and all the things that you might have to do when you got to your first squadron. Side by side, men and women of naval aviation march forward. Fully fledged now, prepared to take their places with the squadrons on land and on board the carriers all over the world. The Rock of Gibraltar. Beneath the shadow of the rock, the home fleet prepares for sea. If you go to an aircraft carrier, when the carrier itself has got a new ship's company, when the squadrons are new, uh, you, you wouldn't believe the shambles that there is on the flight deck. I mean, it, it, and then you couldn't believe that anybody could possibly operate this thing. We had very young, inexperienced pilots of deck landings. We had very young, inexperienced uh, sailors or naval airmen uh, working together in squadron life. Uh, never been to sea before. None of us have been to sea before. We'd, we'd closely worked in training up until that period. Our work up then had to be co-jointly worked together. We learned very, very quickly where the things were on the ship so that we could get them very quickly and easily. We had very, very good mentors. We had very good chiefs and petty officers who worked very closely with us. After uh, three workups, each one being a fortnight, um, you, you couldn't recognize the slick operations that were going on that uh, simply uh, bore no relation to the shambles that, that there was at the beginning. Now the naval aviators will test out their skill under battle conditions. Leading the fleet, the carriers sail out into the glittering Mediterranean. The destroyer escorts hasten to take station alongside. Soon Gibraltar fades astern, and ahead, somewhere beyond the horizon, lurks an enemy force to be destroyed. On board the aircraft carrier, the Admiral charts out his tactics. Reconnaissance planes have spotted an enemy cruiser. A strike force will hound it out, hit first and hit hard. Up on the flight deck, the planes are made ready, spotted for takeoff. Zero hour approaching, the air crews spin out the remaining minutes. The Sea Fury, of course, was really the fighter reconnaissance aircraft. It was the, the fast fighter. The Firefly was the heavy, slow, lumbering, torpedo attack aircraft. Carried a much heavier load than the Sea Fury, with its rockets and its bomb load that it could carry as well. And, and of course, its cannons but the Sea Fury was mainly concerned with rockets under its wings and its cannon fire. Man aircraft. Stand by. Start up. The other most dangerous um, occasions that you had were when you had to lay on your chocks. So you had to lay fore and aft on the chock and then watch the DLC down the, on, the, on the deck. If he swept his arms away, you knew you had to roll out from the aircraft and go. And this you had to do dragging your chocks with you, so you fell into the catwalks at the side of the ship. On one occasion we had a youngster that unfortunately didn't roll out. He got up and walked forward. Nobody ever knew why he walked forward, but he walked forward and was straight into the prop and was killed. 20,000 horsepower set the very deck a quiver as the great ship alters course and turns into the Mediterranean wind. It's a big team effort in an aircraft carrier. Flight deck's a dangerous place, and, and you're, you've, you've, there are propellers going around, and, uh, and a lot of wind over the flight deck, and all these different little things that were going on are done by different departments, different teams, and by the time the ship was properly worked up, they were all working very, very well together, um, and you, it, you can't imagine, it, it, it makes it look easy. Another catapult. Twenty 
2,500 revs. In battle formation, the strike force set out, seeking their quarry. Enemy cruiser to port, 340 degrees. Ninety miles away, the carrier steams ahead. The aircraft handlers enjoy a short spell of sun. Soon the planes will be heading home. Combing the skies, the men below busily scan their radar screens, steering the planes safely back to base. Here comes the first one now. Easing round the bend, she approaches her tiny floating runway. Deck landing is the trickiest and the toughest test of all. One after another, planes enter the circuit. Eyes glued on the batsman, leveling wings poised for the touchdown. Watch that hook catch the arrest a while. Unhooked, the planes taxi forward. Now the aircraft directors take over, passing the planes from one to another. Right up to the very edge of the bows, safely parked, engines cut. Hold your wings. Hold it. Taxi forward. Switch off. The only difficulty with the Sea Fury was the undercarriage was quite hard. American airplanes have a very long stroke undercarriage, and if you touched main wheels first, uh, the in the, an American airplane, the, the undercarriage would absorb that uh, and it wouldn't bounce. In a Sea Fury, it actually stalled before you got to the three-point attitude. So you had to develop a technique to get it into the three-point attitude before you hit the ground. You could only see out uh, that way and that way, uh, which is why when you were doing a deck landing, you had to come around in a constant turn in order to keep sight of the deck landing control officer, the batsman as he was known. So you could only see a bit of him and the left-hand side of the ship. And it wasn't until you got the last two signals, that one was to pick your wing up and the other was to cut the engine, uh, that you got your first glimpse of the deck as a whole. Uh, and it was then a matter of judgment as to when you uh, whip the stick back in order to get it into the three-point attitude uh, so it wouldn't bounce. You were doing a lot of new things all at once. Fire's the danger. The firefighters dash in, their hoses at the ready. Incoming planes must fly round again, hooks down until the deck is clear. Preservation of life and limb, that's the motto on deck, Last stragglers return. Yesterday, it was the wooden walls of Nelson. Now the naval aviators carry the enduring traditions of the waves up into the sky.
at the end of the war, Hawkers were still trying to get more out of a, the Tempest design. The plan would be, let's build another aeroplane that's smaller and lighter and even faster than the Tempest, but still able to carry the same sort of weapons load. This rebuild would require the centre section be cut down in span and mounted to a reworked fuselage, but would retain similar out outer wing panels as fitted to the Tempest. This new aeroplane would become known as the Fury, and it would actually be, but at the time, the fastest piston fighter ever built. The problem, of course, was that the Royal Air Force had loads of new Tempests. They didn't need another fighter. Therefore, there was no real requirement for the Fury for the, Air, the Royal Air Force. But the fleet air arm did need, this, need a fighter. There were versions of the Spitfire available called the Seafire. The problem with the Seafire was, to put it bluntly, it was a pig to lap. This narrow undercarriage meant it was a pig to get onto a carrier deck. But even so, it, it was continuing in service, but purely as a point defence fighter for the fleet. The fleet air arm needed a heavyweight fighter. And so the Fury, or as it would eventually become, the Sea Fury, would be the ideal answer. The early batch of Sea Furies, or, or Furies as they were, um, weren't navalised at all. In fact, the first handful would be basically engine test beds. I mean, it's obvious from the outset that um, the Centaurus was the engine that the Navy wanted. If they're going to have a fighter, it's going to have a radial, big radial engine in the front. But they did try, try it with the Griffin, the same one that powered the Seafire and the, and the later Mark Spitfires. But the Griffin idea was purely a, a fallback, a fallback position should the Centaurus production line either slow down which is, would be the main problem, or there would be a major problem with the engine, which never ever occurred. Naval counterpart of the RAF Fury, the Sea Fury plays her part as a carrier-based fighter. A product of the famous Hawker group, the Sea Fury has a maximum speed of 450 miles per hour and a range of 760 miles. It had good range, because unlike many British fighters, it actually had a reasonable selection of fuel tanks aboard. Little modified from the Fury, apart from the addition of carrier operating gear and power wing folding, the development of this type of aircraft has put the fleet fighter at par with shore-based fighter cover. The use of folding wings as, uh, for the fleet air arm, for, for Navy aeroplanes, is, is an excellent idea. Park your aeroplane on the deck, fold its wings, that instantly means that the hangar access below the uh, lift can be made smaller, you can get more aeroplanes on your, on your ship. The Sea Fury folding wing actually was, there were very few problems with it. It was one of these things that worked straight from the outset. In fact, the British have always been good at folding wings. The original ones for the Sea Fury 10, the first production version, were like the early prototypes, they were a manual fold. We would make sure the locks were in, we'd have to go out and manually put the locks in, there was no um, little quick switch for the pilot. He would be told that the wings were locked by the toggle in the wing going down, which he could visibly see either side if he looked out of his cockpit, and that would tell him that the wings were in fact locked down. If the toggle was still up, he was to wave and the aircraft would be taken aside to see what had gone wrong. But it was the, it was the fitter's job to make sure that the locks were into the aircraft. However, on the production aeroplane, the Fighter Bomber 11, they were hydraulically folded, which made life a whole lot easier. You just moved the lever up or down, and the wings either folded up or they folded down, and the locks, which were also hydraulically driven, were pushed into place. Whereas you're always relying on your ground crew on the Mark 10 to push the locking pins into place manually. The large cowling of the radial engine is made almost to look in line by the extra large spinner. From the cowling, the fuselage rises to the cockpit and then tapers evenly to the fin and rudder. The fin is slightly fared to the fuselage, in contrast to the larger dorsal fairing of the Tempest, a close relation of the Sea Fury. The tail unit is also designed without the heel beneath the fuselage, so prominent a feature of the Tempest. The Sea Fury is powered by a 2,400 horsepower Bristol Centaurus 18. Note how its radial cowling gives the fuselage a circular appearance, 
with the cockpit mounted on top. The centre section of the main plane has no dihedral. On the outer panels, however, dihedral is quite marked. In plan, similar to the Tempest series, the wing shape is almost elliptical, with square-cut tips. The coolant radiators, built into the leading edge of the main plane, project slightly and unevenly on either side of the fuselage. The tail plane of typical Hawker design is easy to remember, equal straight taper to rounded tips with the small cutaway in the trailing edge to allow rudder movement. Note the hump of the blister type cockpit set slightly forward of the main plane trailing edge. This view also shows to advantage the rounded tail unit and the large spinner. When employed as a strike aircraft, the Sea Fury may display a variety of under-the-wing armament. It could carry a, a variety of weapons, bombs, rockets, various, even napalm, although it weren't often used in, in service, leaflet dispensers, and in, on one occasion a reconnaissance pod. The projection beneath the tail unit houses the retraction gear of the arrestor hook. The hook itself can just be seen beneath the rudder. The Fury had to go through a process called navalization. The Navy always requires certain things in its aeroplanes. They have to be structurally very strong. You're coming down at so many feet per minute and you're going to smack into a, a metal deck. And then you're going to stop all of a sudden, all in one go. So that requires an airframe of exceptional strength. But also, you also have to have strong undercarriage because the same thing's happening. You've got, you're trying to stop your aeroplane. It's, it's instantaneous near us, damn it. Landing on a carrier deck, you need assistance because the landing speed is so high and you've got so little distance to stop it. You need an aid and that aid was the arrestor hook, which also required a structurally strengthened airframe. The three quarter rear view shows well the high tailplane and the clean lines of the Sea Fury as a whole. The Sea Fury is armed with four 20mm cannon mounted in the wings. The first production version of the uh, Sea Fury, the Mark 10, was purely intended um, as an interim aircraft. To that end, it was just fitted with its bog standard range of cannon. That's all it carried. However, when the fighter bomber version came into existence, um, it retained the cannon, but added to that was the ability to carry. Uh, general purpose bombs up to a weight of a thousand pounds per pylon or it could carry underwing rockets which if I remember correctly were four per side um, although they were guided and didn't always hit their target the mere launching of these weapons normally was enough to frighten the opposition away from the area they were defending the radiators can be seen quite clearly in this view and note the five bladed rotel air screw the Centaurus engine designed by Bristol um, had already made a success of itself being bolted to the front of the Tempest. Therefore, that was the chosen engine for the Sea Fury. It was powerful, gave the Sea Fury an excellent performance at all altitudes. Of course, the one problem was that this mass of metal on the front of the, of the airframe if the pilot braked too heavily on touchdown, or just after touchdown, there was every chance that this large lump of metal would just keep going into the ground. Very embarrassing. Outside of that though, if they landed it properly, ideal aeroplane, excellent engine, and not given to falling to pieces. Here are some points to help remember the Sea Fury. Radial engine and large spinner, with front fuselage rising to the cockpit. Well-rounded fin and rudder, with tailplane set high. 
And don't forget those almost elliptical wings. It's surprising that the Admiralty didn't decide to buy a trainer version. The first um, examples of a trainer version were actually created for, of all people, the Iraqi Air Force. They had two separate cockpits with two separate canopies on them. The problem was they were so well sealed that the fact that the rear canopy kept collapsing. It was, it was cavitation caused by a, vacu by a vacuum, of all things. It just, the pressures weren't equalised. Which is why on the production versions, especially for the fleet air arm and other foreign buyers, it actually had this big glass house canopy fitted. The fourth Iraqi trainer was commandeered by the Admiralty, refitted to Admiralty standards, which was basically the same as it was then, with just a few extra sort of British bits added, you know, sort of navigation and um, instrumentation. And these were then issued to the training squadrons and also issued to the, um, all the land-based squadrons, many of which were actually reserve units. Um, it had a contraption above the canopy where the uh, instructor in the back seat could actually see what the young lad in the front seat was up to and chastise him mightily if he was about to do something exceptionally stupid. It could be used for weapons training. The only thing it couldn't be used for was carrier landing. Although the airframe was the same, it had no hook and it also retained um, manual folding of the wings. There was no real requirement for the wings to be folded while it was on the ground. Korea had been a Japanese territory, but in 1945 it was divided into two zones, with a Soviet-backed government north of the 38th parallel and an American one to the south. In 1950, the North Koreans invaded the south, but were pushed back by United Nations forces by 1951 the Korean War was at a stalemate. Immediately after World War II, the Royal Navy commenced a program of re-equipping naval aviation with jet aircraft. New types meant new techniques for both pilots and flight deck crews, but no great problem was met in operating them. In 1950, however, well before naval jets were in plentiful supply, war broke out in Korea. The light fleet carriers, operating there from the very beginning of hostilities, were still equipped with a slur but well-tested piston-engined aircraft. However, the Firefly and the Sea Fury were found to be most suitable as fighter bombers supporting the army. These ships, Triumph, Fleetus, Glory and Ocean, and Her Majesty's Australian carrier, the Sydney, are light fleet carriers that have operated naval aircraft for sustained periods off the Korean coast. Mostly laid down in 1943 with a displacement of 13,500 tons, they were completed too late to take an active part in World War II. This carrier, like her sister ships, will soon be in action for the first time. With 21 Sea Furies and 12 Fireflies, she is starting a long passage from Malta to Korea, where she will relieve another carrier that has already flown over 3,000 sorties against the enemy. This passage will also be a busy one, as both the air crews and the flight deck parties have to be worked up to the standard of efficiency and teamwork required in these operations. After the heat of the Red Sea, and refueling at Aden comes that long run across to Singapore. Here, there is a naval air station, HMS Simbang, which is responsible for supplying the Far Eastern carriers with replacement aircraft. The latter aircraft will be ferried to the operating zone by the maintenance carrier, HMS Unicorn, part of the fleet train. The next stop will be Hong Kong, where the pilots will exercise air to ground support with the army. They will fly over the type of country to be met in Korea. Lastly, there is Sazibel, a large natural harbour in the Japanese islands that is used by United Nations navies as a replenishment base. Here, the ship will refuel, restore, and be finally briefed by the task force commander for her forthcoming operations. Now, let us take a typical day on this passage out. Flag Fox is hoisted, and the ship turns into wind to fly off the first aircraft in the day's programme. They are briefed carry out deck landing practice. I joined Glory in the Mediterranean <coughs> when she was working up to go back to Korea. This was in uh, 1952. You see, a carrier takeoff is a comparatively simple thing. It is the deck landing that must be practiced continuously because however successful a bombing trip may have been, a 
crash on return is as valuable to the enemy as being shot down. A perfect touchdown. Handlers rush out to disengage the hook from the arrestor wire and the aircraft is cleared for it to make way for the next landing. The other problem was that it had a very powerful engine. You had a five-bladed propeller. If you got slow on the approach and thought, my God, I'm, I'm too slow, and open the throttle too quickly, then the propeller would hold on to the air and turn the airplane right upside down and straight in. And that was a, a factor with the Sea Fury that made it uh, people a little bit wary of it. Uh, if, you, if you open the throttle in conjunction with countering the thrust, then that was all right. But if you forgot to, then that airplane would, it would turn you over. Slick teamwork by the naval airmen, including the hookman and this marshalling director, are as important in flight deck work as the pilot's skill in flying at exactly the right attitude, the right speed, and the right height. Right, we get them parked, and there was always parked forward of the barrier. The, there were two barriers, and the one on the foremost part of the ship, all the aircraft were parked behind that. They'd be parked as neat as you could, again in the herringbone style, in order to get the most aircraft in that one space. After all the aircraft had landed on, your jobs then were the airframe fitter and the engine fitter would go quickly to the aircraft and start the routine checks. Make sure there were no oil leaks, make sure nothing else was happened, no bits were hanging off, and there'd be no damage. The um, aircraft handlers would start moving the aircraft and move about. The safety equipment boys would go in and retrieve all the pilot chutes and the various apparatus, dinghies and that sort of thing and take them away. The Air, the engine people and the airframe people, that's the two air mechanics, would be responsible for refueling the aircraft. And that you would get when you were told that the aircraft was in the fueling state, you'd fuel the aircraft. Um, you, you didn't do it haphazardly, it was always done under very, very strict control. Being a zap gas is a very difficult term, volatile fuel to use, so we had to be very careful. The next important drill is the catapulting of aircraft. Heavy bomb loads in Korea necessitate this form of takeoff every time. Then we had the occasion when the catapult refused to work one day and we had to have fit the radar to the Furies. We couldn't fit them to the Fireflies but we fitted them to the Furies. And the pilots had not had any chance to learn to take off with these and being boost the rockets, they were there to boost the aircraft off. And when the pilot done his little switch in the cockpit, all the rockets should have fired and shot him off the deck. Fleet Air Arm has always been interested in getting its aeroplanes off its carrier decks in the quickest way possible. Now obviously their uh, carriers are fitted with steam catapults, but just occasionally when they're not working. Another method had to be used, and this was rocket-assisted takeoff gear. These were fitted underneath the aeroplane, tubular, in clusters of two or three, depending on the aircraft size and, uh, and weight. This would de deliver a short burst of high-powered thrust, which would lift the aeroplane into the sky. Credit where credit is due, most of the time, it worked. Unfortunately, we had an occasion with young Petty, uh, Pay, um, Pilot 3 Lines, uh, with his rockets on the starboard side fired, the rockets on the port side didn't fire, and so it tended to tend to turn him over. Fortunately, he gained control and the aircraft was back down on the deck, and there was the catastrophe was then solved. The briefing would be, you line up on the ship, and you open the throttle, and when the green flag goes down, you let the brakes off, and off you go. There's a little man further up the deck, he will have a red flag, and he will drop the red flag, and you will fire the rate on. If the rate hog does not fire, then you will have time to stop. Oh, that's good. So my turn came. I opened up the throttle, green flag dropped, off I went. Got to the little red man with the red flag. I dropped the throttle, he dropped his flag. I pushed the button and stuff all happened, absolutely. So I put the brakes on hard. And the aircraft sort of went, 
went straight towards the, the bows. So I thought, it'll stop, but it didn't. I went over the bows of the ship at an approximately uh, two miles an hour. Now, sea fury, no matter how high, hard you pull in the stick, will not fly at that state. So I shut my eyes, and the next time I opened them, after a long pause, I was just in time to see the propeller disc hit the water. So I shut my eyes again. It seemed the wise thing to do. Now, the hood would be open, so it was open, and so when I opened the hood, I, I was in the water, and the aircraft was sinking fast and going down. So I then had to disconnect myself from the aircraft. I got out of the cockpit, the airplane was sinking down, upside down, beside me. And I thought, what am I doing? I'll have to wait down here you know, until that ship passes. Because I hadn't seen the ship. I thought the ship would have hit me, but it didn't. And I th then a little voice said, don't be a bloody idiot, Lee. You'll drown if you stay down here. So I thought, right, well, I better go up. Which way is up? And I wasn't too sure, so I pulled my May West. And that sent me in the right direction, so I shot off what, to what I thought was out from the ship. And I came to the surface about 10 yards out from the starboard after prop, the starboard prop. Uh, I took a great big breath of air, which turned out to be water because my oxygen tube was still dangling in the, in the sea. Tore the mask off, in time to see a little sailor out in the quarter deck who was busy scrubbing the quarter deck look at me and obviously think, oh, these aviators are at it again, and went back to his scrubbing as I drifted off behind the ship. The destroyer sent its lifeboat to get me. When the destroyer, when, when, the, when it came alongside the destroyer, I got so frightened I nearly tried to climb out again. But I got in and they said, right, you better come and have a tot. And I said, well, I'd better not, I said, because I'm on the flying program for this afternoon, you see. And I think it must have been shock that made me turn down the thing. But it proved that we couldn't use the Raytogs efficiently and so they were discarded until a later date. But in fact, then after that, we didn't use them at all. Gradually, the number of deck landings mounts up. And since practice makes perfect, it is easy to see how these Korean carriers have several times completed over a thousand consecutive landings without a deck accident. Well, we had quite a few accidents on the deck, mainly um, mishaps by not catching the right arrest wire. If you caught arrest wire number 10, there were 10 arrest wires, if you caught arrest wire number 10, you knew that the aircraft was going to go into the barrier. It would go into the first barrier. And if you were very, very fortunate, it would only shatter the prop or bend the prop. If, however, you missed the wires and you went into the barriers at full pelt, then, of course, you nearly you wrecked the aircraft. We had several occasions where hooks would break off when the aircraft was coming into land. The hook would actually pull off the A-frame, and of course the aircraft had nothing to stop it and go straight into the barriers. We had one occasion when um, an Lieutenant Bailey, he came in with a firefly, he missed all the wires, he boosted to go off again, but unfortunately his hook still being in the down position, and in those days you couldn't retract the hook, so it's hanging down four or five foot from the aeroplane. You couldn't, he couldn't retract it while, when he was in the air, and the hook, as he was boosting to go off in the surge, caught the barrier as it was on the way down. This pulled him back, pulled all the arrestor arrangement off the aircraft, and the aircraft went straight into the forward park. The fireflies it knocked over the bows and the sea furies it knocked into the side sponsons. We had something like seven aircraft actually written off in that one little accident. Notwithstanding the, <laughs> the story about the pilot <coughs> who landed after his first sortie in, sent for the, the, the man who looked after his radio and said, the radio is not working chief, it's, it's, it's uh, faulty. And the chief said, all right, I'll check it so before it's next detail. The pilot was off again on its next detail, both air, air crew and the airplane having sat in the deck while the next lot had not. pilot went off again, came back, Chief, he said, that aircraft, it's not working. He said, well, I'll check it again, sir. At the end of the third sort, he came back and he said, no, it's not working. 
And the chief said, well, I think the problem must be between, must be between your earphones. <laughs> so that's an apocryphal story. But it, it was a Firefly pilot, not a Fury pilot. <laughs> So it goes on. Well, as far as delivering weapons were concerned, you were very well prepared because you'd done a lot of that uh, back in the UK. Obviously, for training purposes, using full-blown 1,000-pounder general-purpose bombs, it's expensive. It also leaves big holes in the ground. What was known as the smoke and flash bomb was invented. Um, this small bomb, uh, weighing no more than around about the 28-pound mark, was used by trainee pilots to understand how their aircraft delivered weaponry. A similar idea would be used with the rockets. Again, you've got all the problems associated with a live weapon, a live warhead. So instead of having a warhead on a rocket, they put a 60 pound lump of concrete. Not only would this give the pilots the feel of flying an aeroplane with this particular weapon fitted, i.e. The, the heaviness of the controls, etc., etc. They could also, if they needed to, use these weapons as training weapons and fire them at targets without destroying the targets, which obviously would be want to be used again and again. The next aircraft are briefed to carry out rocket and bomb attacks against a target towed astern of the ship. An attendant destroyer has a seabirds crew standing by for any missed landings. This duty can now be carried out by a helicopter. The end of the day and a clear deck. In the hangar, mechanics and artificers work on the aircraft in preparation for the next day's flying program. Their work goes on well after flying, especially during Korean operations. The general maintenance would go on in the hangars. You had the strip downs, the change of ailerons, change of flaps, change of undercarriage at some times. Again, you have to be very, very careful due to the fact that the aircraft the ship being at sea, you had the roll in motion, you had the pitch in motion, and you had to have these aircraft on jacks very, very securely lashed down so they couldn't move. Not a job we like doing whilst at sea. These jobs are normally done when we went into harbour. Up top, pilots and the flight deck party have enough energy left for a game of deck hockey. Everybody must keep fit. Down below in the galley, the cooks are ready to feed the ship's company. During operational periods, pilots and air crewmen will require to eat at odd times of the day as the flying program permits. Eventually, the ship will arrive in Korea and her aircraft will find many jobs waiting for them. Firstly, blockade, preventing the enemy from supplying its frontline troops by sea. Perhaps a coastal vessel or a fleet of junks will be sunk by the early morning patrol. Secondly, carefully briefed and heavily armed strikes on the main North Korean bases such as Pyongyang and Chinampo. Thirdly, interdiction, the disruption of enemy supply routes behind his front line. Constant armed reconnaissance catches all troops and transport moving by day. Fourthly, close air support, working with forward observation posts and spotter planes, targets can be attacked a few hundred yards ahead of the army. Fifthly, combat air patrols and anti-submarine patrols around the fleet. When you were trained and you got your wings, you would be sent to Operational Flying School 1, and then Operational Flying School 2, where you learn how to use your weapons. And then it was uh, said Korea was Operational Flying School 3. Let us switch now to the carrier already in Korea. For the last few days flying, she is taking on oil, fuel and aviation spirit from a fleet oiler while her screening destroyers also need refueling. High intensity flying during the past six months has not only meant frequent oiling operations like this, but also periodical visits to Sazibel to replace the 600 tons of bombs and rockets and over a half a million rounds of cannon ammunition expended by the aircraft. The provision of weapons was slick. The, the bombs arrived, the, the, the sort of uh, cannon fodder arrived, everything on it and that. The destroyers in the task group have had long periods of escort duty in sometimes very unkind weather conditions. Never mind the fact that it was appalling weather sometimes. Uh, there was very cold all the time we were there. As the oiling operation comes to an end, 
the flight deck party fall in and prepare to range aircraft for the next detail of strikes. The aircraft have had black and white stripes painted on their wings because they resemble some enemy types, such as the IL-2 and the LA-5. We would fly two or three sorties a day, each pilot, and then after four days you were quite ready for the, uh, for the day off, and then the next four days you'd be back on operations again. Up forward, the squadron ordnance mechanics had fitted the high explosive heads to the rocket motors and, together with ship's gunners and members of the Royal Marine Band at their action stations, armed the aircraft. Not even the cold air streams sweeping down from Siberia were allowed to interfere with these preparations. The weather was our worst enemy. Um, none of us realised um, how cold it could be, and we were inadequately clothed for this sort of weather. We, we had to wear two or three uniforms under oil skins and things in order to try and keep warm. And, uh, in, and when we think about that today, we realise how short the uh, services are in places like Iraq where they haven't got the right equipment. We didn't have the right equipment then. You had severe minus temperatures, you had blizzards, you had snow, but the operation still had to continue on a slippy slidey carrier deck. Your aircraft that you're working on or you're trying to launch is covered in snow, so you've got to get the snow off, you've got to get the ice off. You have to make sure that everything works. You have to tr find a way of covering the engines, possibly to keep them warm. Many of us took our oil skins out of our kit bags. Where we'd been in the tropics, the oil skins all the tar had melted together, and so we couldn't even wear them. It was hard on the carriers, it was hard everywhere in a Korean winter trying to keep operational flying going, but they did it somehow, through, mainly through hard graft, I should think. Off Korea, there was a friendly island called Chodo, uh, another one called Panyondo. Uh, now, in January uh, uh, 1953, the weather got so cold that the sea froze, and it froze all the way out to the island of Chodo, to the extent that the North Koreans uh, started to drive their trucks on the ice uh, because it was so thick and, uh, and it was therefore an indication that they were getting to a position where they could invade these islands which we were using. So we were switched from bombing railway lines and bridges and things like that to bombing the ice to break it up um, uh, so that they couldn't do that. And that, we did that for about two or three days, uh, and then the weather changed slightly. As hands are called to flying stations, the next detail of pilots, observers and their crewmen are briefed on their various objectives. Positions of the targets and our own troops, the weapons to be used and the flak to be expected, the photographs required and the escape routes available for crew shot down are only a few points carefully gone into. During the last few minutes, an observer checks his navigation in the ready room and his pilot helps by taking the camera to the aircraft. Before leaving, others check their escape gear such as food, revolvers and ammunition in case they are forced down behind enemy lines. Then comes main aircraft. You climbed onto the flight deck and you couldn't see across the flight deck for fog. I thought, like, oh, we're not going to fly in this for goodness sake. And you'd get to the Met briefing. And the Met man would say, right, the weather is this, this, this and this. And this is midwinter, don't forget, in Korea, where the sea would freeze over. And I'd say, uh, and it should be quite clear, what about the fog? What fog? There's no fog on my chart. <laughs> so <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was, on this particular occasion, my number three was the first one on the catapult. And he was up there with fog streaming past him. And they were still setting everything up. And he thought, this is ridiculous, you know. And, and he, a little man ran across and jumped on the wing. And he thought, oh, the launch is cancelled. Great, you see. And he pulled his helmet across to hear what this chap was saying above the noise of his engine. And he said, if you don't come back, can I have your radio? <laughs> <laughs> the airplane was round off and then launched and we off we went. He didn't come back, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> While pilots man aircraft that have had previous bombing sorties recorded on their carlings by the mechanics, an air crewman in the two-seater Firefly waves au revoir to the photographer and at the same time the RC rescue helicopter is manned. In the flying control position of the bridge, 
The order is given, stand by to start up, and the pilots wait with their fingers on the starter buttons. Start up, and the engines of the closely packed range burst into life. Any aircraft persistently refusing to start means a tricky journey through propeller slip streams for the repair party. Meanwhile, the helicopter is airborne, ready for the first takeoff. In a continuous stream, the heavily armed aircraft are detached from the main range and directed up to the catapult. The average number of daily sorties is 65 to 70, while the record stands at over 120. When an all-out offensive is called for, pilots have to fly at least four times a day. The maximum number of sorties that were carried out in one day from a light fleet carrier was 123 operational sorties. Now that meant that everybody and some of us flew five sorties in the day. Uh, the previous carrier, HMS Ocean, had set that record. And we set ourselves to do that record and complete by tea time. <laughs> so, that, so that we could have gone on, but we said, well, well, we've done it. We don't want to start a war here. We just set the record and we had 123 armed sorties carried out from glory uh, on that day. By now, such things as expert teamwork between these pilots, the directors, the handlers and the flight deck engineers in getting launching times down to a minimum are taken for granted. The air crews have even got so used to the constant squirts off the catapult that the excessive g-force no longer has much effect on their senses. The stokers have hooked the aircraft on. The stoker department looked after all the catapults and they looked after the rest of wires. The pilot opens the throttle to full power. The engine room artificer waits for the flight deck officer's signal. Down green flag and away we go. As the last aircraft gets away, the preceding strikes join circuit and land on. The landing signals officer, or BATS, guides them in. The returning aircraft are parked close up forward to make a clear deck for those landing and will immediately be refueled and rearmed for the next sortie. Meanwhile, the rain's just flown off and takes departure towards the objectives. Almost before they are away, an unidentified aircraft is picked up by the ship's radar. Action stations. More fighters are scrambled. Whatever it was disappears off the screen. But if it had been an enemy, the ship's guns were ready manned, and the light beam carrier's anti-aircraft armor packs quite a punch, as you can see. Our aircraft are meanwhile approaching the enemy coast and will soon be splitting up into separate flights for their various duties. One flight is due to support a marine commando landing to raid an enemy outpost. They are acting on intelligence supplied by air reconnaissance. As the marines go ashore, a Canadian destroyer waits to give a covering barrage. The call for help will come as the hidden enemy halts the advance of the Marines. Fire. The Firefly checks the fall of shot from over the target and gives corrections over the RT. Will be the time for the Führers and Fireflies to come in with their bombs, rockets and cannon.
Under this cover of ship and aircraft bombardment, they advance, and the objective is gained. A patrol would last 10 days, four days operations, one day's refueling and rearming, and four days operations. And then we would go back to Japan for 10 days, and the Americans would send the Bonhomme Richard with Corsairs to do its bit, and, and, and we would swap over between. Well, when we was up at Kai Tak, the, um, the, all the aircraft were ashore, the Sea Furies and the Fireflies. And the Sea Fury on the particular time was being taken off by Lieutenant Delaney. And unfortunately, the starboard wing hadn't been fully locked. And as he got lift on the aircraft, the wing lifted higher and folded. That caused him to swerve and go into the sea. Fortunately, it was right at the end of the runway, and so he didn't have a lot of water he had to go in, but he went into the sea. He climbed out and came away to the shore. That was, that was um, a very, very bad start to the flying at Kai Tak. The operations uh, were quite intense as far as we were concerned. The tension was very high, of course. We were limited to a particular area where we would attack. We attacked bridges, railways, roads, tunnels, railway tunnels, and troops which were reported to be in villages. Well, the Sea Furies also had to fly combat air patrol over the ship in case uh, there were any intruders. Other aircraft go further inland for other brief targets. They hit an oil plant and other vital objectives, while some are off to attack a coastal vessel that has been reported earlier in the day off Chinam Perry. Yet another Firefly is reporting fall or shot for the American battleship, the Mighty Mare. A battleship could reach targets 14 miles inland. Back in the ship's direction room, a course home for the returning pilots has been checked, and hands are called to prepare the next range for flight. This happens at least six times a day, and there is little respite for the maintenance and the handling parties. Overall, we managed a 95% serviceability rate for the aircraft all the time we was in Korea, which then enabled us to receive the Boyd Trophy, which is a very high award. We got very proficient at knocking down bridges not as proficient as the Koreans at rebuilding the damn things. I mean, they, they would you'd knock a bridge down, a big hole, gone, the bridge would be gone. Come back the next day, the bridge would be back again. With yet another detail of 16 to 20 aircraft airborne, the ships goes to landing on stations, but some of the aircraft have been hit. No one is hurt, however, and Jumbo the Crane soon clears the deck. Meanwhile, there is a quick debriefing by the squadron commanders to find any last-minute targets of importance for the departing strike. Half of these aircraft are going to work with Army spotter planes and United States Air Force jets in giving the ground forces closer support, while the remainder will give more indirect help by harrying the enemy's lines of communication. Catching the enemy's transport on the road to the front, blowing up his bridges, tearing up his railway lines, bombing and strafing goops dug in on hilltops, all finds naval aircraft flying alongside those of the various United Nations land-based air forces. They are part of a massive weapon on the Army's side. Now, although the Sea Fury is amongst the fastest piston engine aircraft in the world, they are yet too slow to be sent up to the Manchurian border to hunt the enemy jet fighter, the MiG-15. Their speed did not stop them, however, from shooting down one of these 600-knot aircraft and crippling two more when eight of them were met over Chinam Po. If you stayed within 
your designated area, we didn't have, uh, in my time, any trouble with names. Also, you could stretch it a little bit if the F-86s were keeping the MiGs embroiled. But as we found out, if you stretched it a little bit and they weren't being embroiled by the, uh, uh, the F-86s, a couple of MiGs would be after you like a flash. You were very conscious that they were about. We weren't uh, particularly afraid of the MiG because as long as we could see it, we did not think he could catch us. We were so much more manoeuvrable. Their fuel consumption at low level was very high. Um, and so they tended to stay high and then come, uh, try to get behind you, and then come diving down and make one pass. The fact that the MiG was coming was not a problem. You kept an astonishingly good lookout. Um, and you flew in a tidal formation where each one of you could look after the tail of one of the others. If you were high enough, then the American uh, radar, which was on one of the offshore islands, could give you assistance. And if they saw uh, bandits coming out in your direction, they would tell you. And what we had to do then was go like as fast as we could to get over the sea, because the MiGs did not want to come over the sea and mess about. I think in the HMS Ocean, in an earlier encounter, where they did shoot down a MiG, uh, that's when the MiG pilot was uh, silly enough to try to mix it. We have to remember that it was a Sea Fury flown by Lieutenant Commander Hoagie Carmichael that in fact shot a MiG down over Korea. In our case, we hadn't reached the sea and we were bounced by two MiGs, four of us. Uh, we broke to port and as I, as I broke round, I looked at the, uh, at the jet, which was coming straight at me, with this 37 millimeter gun going a boom for boom for boom underneath it. Luckily, it was pointing at me, and I was going at right angles, so I thought, he's going to miss me. A fury would turn tighter than a MiG. Um, so if he tried to follow you around, and uh, if they were silly enough to try and mix it, um, they would find that they, they were slowly giving the advantage to the Sea Furies. Started to reverse my turn, he shot past and was off and away like a rocket. And he didn't come back. Neither of them, they, they, they made their pass, they missed, and they weren't going to try again. They, they, that was their, their little job. Because they knew anyway that we were going to be over the sea the next time round, and they, they just did not like that. So we would if we could, uh, would ease out over the sea uh, and they wouldn't follow us. Uh, and then we'd go back in again. But the, I've got a feeling that that's because the MiGs were not all flown by Chinese or North Koreans. And I think there were a few Russian pilots in there. And that might be a reason that they didn't want to come out over the sea because the Allied uh, group had total control of the sea. And if one of theirs came down in the sea, uh, they'd find that very embarrassing, especially if it was a Russian pilot. The enemy's speed advantage was nullified by the maneuverability of the naval aircraft and the quality of the pilots. We lost one, one lost on a carrier accident, and one because he had a problem and ditched us alongside the ship and didn't get out of the, out of the aircraft. Nor did the aircraft always get away scot-free, but thanks to the initiative and courage of the helicopter rescue pilots in picking up downed air crew under fire and well behind enemy lines, many pilots are brought back to their parent carrier and live to fight another day. There was one occasion when we lost somebody and in searching for this downed pilot, in bad weather, we lost two pilots. Almost at the end, we lost another young pilot who was a first class boy uh, when he was attacking a target, and, and that was it. This aircraft brought back yet another pilot who was shot down but rescued under fire by helicopter and taken to a rear base hospital for temporary patching up. Now, he returns to continue his flying operations. The sort of rule of thumb was that uh, when you've done about uh, 90 to 100 
operational sorties over North Korea, uh, that's when they sent you home and uh, somebody else came out. By the time you'd survived Korea, you knew how to use your weapons and fly your airplane. Yeah. At the time I went home, I'd done about 100, 101 operational sorties over North Korea. One ship, however, the Theseus, was in the home fleet when she was hurriedly sailed for the Far East, and she continues her passage back to Portsmouth. Here, with families eagerly awaiting her arrival, she experiences the kind of welcome that many ships have come home to in the past. After the USA threatened nuclear war, the Korean conflict finally ended in 1953. Her air squadrons have been awarded the Boyd Trophy during the ship's absence. The proudest moment as well, like all of us, I think, was getting the Boyd Trophy. This is an award made every year for the finest feat of naval aviation. An opportunity has now been taken by Admiral of the Fleet Lord Fraser, who officially welcomed the ship back, to present the trophy to the 17th Carrier Air Group because that showed that somebody appreciated what we had done. And the mere fact that when we came home, we had numerous admirals and first sea lord, second sea lord, third sea lord, fifth sea lord, all down to come and see us, all visited us when we came into Portsmouth. And then the proud day, of course, then was coming from uh, Spithead, where nobody had ever wanted to line the ship going into harbours. It was always a chore. But that particular morning when we got off Spithead, we all wanted to be on the deck. There was enough room on the deck for all of us, but we all wanted to be on the deck to come in. And that was a very proud moment. After the Korean War, the, the Sea Fury really would begin to fade away from the, the front lines of the, of the fleet air arm. Um, jet aeroplanes were on the horizon, and they were going to be the big thing, the next big thing. There was no need anymore for a high-speed fighter aircraft. Um, no more were being built. In fact, most of those that had been built were slowly but surely going to, to other air forces, such as Canadians who picked up a few, um, the Australians would pick up a few, a few extras, to, both of which um, nations were already operating the Sea Fury. The Pakistan Air Force would have some, others would go to um, Morocco, Egypt, and uh, to Iraq. After the Sea Fury had left the fleet air arm, or even as it was leaving the fleet air, I mean, um, other people were interested in it. I mean, let's face it, it was a good aeroplane, did what it was supposed to do. Um, the German government, through one of its agencies, became very interested in the Sea Fury, not as an attack aircraft, but as a target tower. They bought mainly the two-seat trailers, but they did have one single-seater, and they painted them all bright red. Good colour. Makes it a lot easier for the gunners to shoot at them apparently, according to one of, it, one of their pilots. But they did their job. They had towed targets. The targets got shot at by Navy, Air Force, Army gunners. And, that would, and they kept going until they were eventually, in fact, provided um, a good reservoir of machines for the Americans. The Americans love the Sea Fury. They love it because it is really strong, or well, the center section is really strong, and they love it because they can fly it at Reno. Now the Reno Sea Furies are some are so modified that you would have problems recognising it as a Sea Fury. The only thing that gives it away is the wing centre section. They've had um, the fuselage chopped down in height, so there's a, a, a micro canopy fitted. They've had the wings clipped, they've had the tailplanes clipped, the fin and rudder have been redone. And they've also started putting Pratt & Whitley engines on the front. And when these are fitted onto the uh, front of a Sea Fury, they're now known as corn cob Sea Furies, mainly because of the slightly different way the radi radial pots are laid out. We're talking in the, in the region of ooh, 500, 550 miles an hour, which is not bad going, bearing in mind that the Sea Fury itself, straight and level flight, flat out, could probably get to 400, 450 knots without even, you know, without even breaking a sweat. The Sea Fury, bearing in mind the circumstances that faced the fleet air arm, was the right aeroplane in the right place at the right time. It gave, them, it gave the fleet air arm um, a stable strike attack platform, a good fighter with long legs that was more than capable of holding its own in combat against anything that came towards it, including the MiG-15. It had uh, even more power than the Sea Fire. Um, it had a, a more roomy cockpit, uh, 
It, it also was a very beautiful aeroplane to fly. It, it, uh, the control harmonization on the Fury was very good. All in all, a good aircraft. They were very easy aeroplanes to maintain and service. They were very, very good at their jobs. And the pilots that flew them knew, knew their jobs absolutely 100%. So they were very, very likeable aeroplanes. They were the last of the piston-type aircraft we had uh, because just after we came back from Korea, we, we started then using the jet aircraft, the attacker and the Seahawks and all that started coming. It gave the Royal Navy a competent fighter for combat in Korea at the right time.